All righty. Well, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live all across the internet. We should be able to see you folks here very soon on Twitch, on YouTube, on Periscope, and on Facebook. My name is Patrick. I work at the aquarium here in social media. And joining me across the bay from her house is Emily. Emily, how are you doing over there? I am doing okay, Patrick. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Okay, everyone. So if you are on the chat, we've been having issues with audio. We believe we may have had a fix here. So let us know. Can you hear us in the chat? Do we sound okay? This is my microphone speaking to all of you folks. Hopefully that's and, working. And, and this is my microphone talking to all of you right now. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me too. Let us know if you can. We're just going to let folks join in on the stream. We are here live right now with our sea otter cam. And uh, what's very special about the sea otter cam, you might be able to see on the lower right corner there, we have a little number there, a permit number, because this is a special live stream where we have some otters that are destined to be released back out into the wild. Those otters are uh they have numbers which we'll get into here in just a little bit but this is a very special thing that the u.s fish and wildlife service is letting us do they've given us an exemption on our permit to be able to show you this amazing video as we've got some jacuzzi bubbles happening there in the otter spa from one of the otters getting very excited over there uh patrick i yes. just wanted to report it sounds like people can hear us good and clear now yay we did it let's yay let's let's let take a moment to celebrate that cross your flippers please cross your flippers make sure that the sound holds up we believe that we figured out what was going on Oh my goodness, this feel I was having flashbacks to last Friday. Okay, so it looks <laughs> like everyone is tuning in from all around. We got Lodi, California is there. Everybody is there. Awesome. Okay. So Emily, now that I feel yeah. now that I feel like 25% solid on this, and looks like Curtis is now moving the cam around, we have a very special guest that we need to introduce because not only do we need to introduce the sea otters that we have here, we've got both Ivy and Kits that you folks may recognize with their surrogate pups as well as a companion. And we'll talk about that. But Emily, can you introduce to us our illustrious guest that should be tuning in as well from her respective office? Uh, go for it, Emily, and I'll bring the graphics yeah, up. We, yeah, I think that you already did, did a great job. Uh, but right now we are joined by the illustrious, as you put it, Patrick, Michelle. Michelle actually works with our Sea Otter program. Uh, and she is going to help us answer some of your sea otter questions. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Emily. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Michelle. Hi. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody in the chat, can we get some waves, some thumbs up, some sea otter emoji? Can we get those in the chat to welcome Michelle here to this afternoon live stream? Hey, Michelle. Uh, Michelle Stedler, uh, we should mention. Michelle, can you tell uh, the folks at home what is your job here uh, at the aquarium? You get to play with sea otters is usually what people might say, but what is your what is your job with? Well, with actually... Actually, Patrick, my job is a sea otter program manager, nice. and I oversee all the things that happen in the sea otter program, including wild otter research, which is where I used to do a lot of my work in the wild on otters with flipper tags that we could study. I also look at the otters and help manage the program here with the surrogate otter that you see on exhibit right now. And we've been really lucky to have these guys available for the public to see this time around. So we thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for allowing us to exhibit them. Absolutely. And um, Emily, I think you've got the, the sheet up. If you want to give us just a quick introduction here of which otters we have here uh, in view, who's who, and then uh, Michelle will follow up with you um, about what what we can expect here for these uh, these otters that we have here. But Emily, I believe you've got you've got <laughs> The, the lowdown. Yeah, here. I got the rundown here. As so we're looking at some sea otters in, in the spot. In yeah, right now. exactly. Oh, this it. is a great view of Ivy, our sea otter currently. So uh, you can tell that one is Ivy as we're zooming out again uh, because of that bright blonde fur that she has all over her head and chest. Uh, so that's going to be the easiest otter to spot in here. The other easiest otter to spot in here is going to be Kit. Uh, Ivy and Kit are both resident otters here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. 
uh, which means that they are themselves rescued otters that were deemed non-releasable to the wild. Now they act as surrogate mothers or foster mothers for orphan sea otter pups. So right now you see Ivy towing around her pup. That is pup 883, 883. And then Kit is the other otter that you see in the spa right now with another pup. Uh, Kit is the other large brown otter. She's going to be the largest otter in the exhibit currently. Uh, but Kit is hanging out with pup 882. So we have pup 883 and pup 882. Uh, that are being taken care of and being taught right now by Ivy and Kit. Uh, but we also have a fifth sea otter in the exhibit currently, and that is going to be Otter 860, 860. Um, she's about 16 months old-ish, and she's also a rescued female. And you can tell her apart from the other otters because she has those flipper tags on her. She's an animal that's going to be returned to the wild. And so uh, I know, Michelle, you mentioned a moment ago that you used to go out there in the field and study otters with those flipper tags. Those flipper tags are a way that we can identify who is who out there in the wild. Yeah, that's correct. And each each otter that's in the wild and even our rehab otters, when we put them out in the wild, we give them two uniquely identifiable flipper tags, one on each flipper in a different color so that we know that when we see a certain color like turquoise and white, that that belongs to a specific individual. Um, there the, she is right now, 860, with those flipper tags. You're getting a great view of her. Yeah, awesome. And uh, yeah. Michelle, we've got we've got a few questions that are that are coming in. Uh, one of the biggest questions that we get when we talk about these otters that are released out to the wild is why the numbers and why not the why not give them a name? So what what is the scientific reason behind that? Well, initially. We were giving some of our otters, our rehab otters, when they were, were released names, but we figured that if they were out there more often, people would get attached to them. So if we had an otter named April and everybody knew April was out there, they suddenly became interested in her and it became difficult um, to do the research on her that we wanted. And another reason is when the otters are in house, um, it's easier for people to remember their names and become more attached to them if they have a name. So if you have a number, it's a little harder to become attached to an individual. And that's important because these otters are definitely not going to be staying with us. Uh, the goal is for them to go back out into the wild and to disappear into the background there into that wild sea otter population. And so um, that's why, folks, if you're asking like Pup 883, Otter 860, what's going on there? Those are the scientific case <laughs> numbers there for those otters because hopefully they can just disappear back into otter anonymity as we currently have Ivy, I think, just <laughs> deciding, no, the <laughs> trying, just saying, no, you come here. No, for you folks out there who I'm might be at home with your children, you might be recognizing some behaviors right now in terms of maternal care of trying to get wrangle your <laughs> wrangle your kids to go where it is that you need them to go we're seeing a little bit of that there uh with ivy but so okay yeah that was that was just to wrap up on the numbers there yeah take take it away uh what, what are you thinking emily and michelle oh no i just saw another question here on periscope that kind of has to do with what we were talking about of tracking those individual otters once they have reached otter anonymity out there in the wild what technology do we use to track them michelle Ooh, good question yeah, well, besides using the flipper tags, um, we have what's called VHF radio transmitters. So each otter is given a radio transmitter that's surgically implanted in their abdominal cavity. And we are able to go out in the field with an antenna and an instrument like a receiver, and we will plug in that otter's radio frequency and listen to see if they're in the area. Sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. And if they're not, then we move on to the next area. But if we find somebody in a specific location, then we get out our spotting scopes. We have these really fancy spotting scopes that we set up and we can start looking for the otter and we look for those flipper tags. And then that flipper tag will tell us who that otter is or sort of verify for us that that's the specific otter we're listening for. And um, then we start recording data. That's, that's awesome. so important. Yeah. Yeah. And M Michelle, um, how long have you been tracking sea otters out here along the along the the coast here? People are, are wondering how long have you been uh, doing this job? I have been tracking otters for 35 years. Wow. I started 
I started as a volunteer when I was in school and spent a year or two as a volunteer working on a program with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and then eventually was able to um, get paid for what I was doing and uh, moved on up from there. That's awesome. Emily, were you seeing another question there? I am looking through these questions right now. Um, we had a question here asking about the color of the fur that they have on their heads. I know that that Ooh. is um, something mm -hmm. that we chatted about a little bit earlier on a stream with Carl, but Michelle, can you explain what that white fur is and if it means that they're older or younger? So, yeah, sure, Emily. Um, the white fur, what we call, we call it grizzle on their heads. And in most cases, it is when the otters start to get a little bit older, but sometimes it's also very genetically distinct between individuals, just like humans. You may get gray hair sooner than I may get gray hair or another person, or sometimes they don't get it at all and they remain very dark for a long time. I, I always think that going getting more grizzled always sounds better than going gray. <laughs> so yeah, I think that we need to adapt that for, for humans as well, Michelle. Yeah and, that, yeah, and that's also where the term uh, kelp grizzly came from for certain people. You know, people love to have different names for sea otters, right? Like um, glorified sea weasel is something that you hear a lot, mm -hmm. depending on yeah. which blog you're, you're looking at trying to get clicks. Um, you've also got marine wolverines, but then kelp grizzly. Um, a grizzly bear is based off of that grizzling that they get that blondness that they also get yeah. on them as well. So if you've ever heard the term kelp grizzly, it has to do with that. Um, I, I can actually bring up here just super quick. Uh, we, we had Carl on the other day, and I'm just going to pull Carl's graphic up because you'll see um, just how blonde or actually here. Uh, if you folks want to answer another question, I'll see if I can bring up yeah. the the uh, grizzled illustration. Um, so here, stand by. I'll I'll pull that up, and then uh, and then uh, yeah, here let's answer another question. Then I'll pull up that grizzling that that there can be. Yeah. So we have a question over here on YouTube, wondering what a common reason is why sea otters have to be rescued, Michelle. That's a really good question. Um, a lot of times. A lot of our pups, or a lot of the animals that we rescue are pups, pups that have gotten separated from their mothers. We don't always know the reason why they were separated, but we have had some cases where the mother was shark bitten and the pup wasn't, and um, the pup is on the beach without a mother. There could be reasons by storms. Um, most of the time, we just don't know, but those are some of the things that we can assume have happened, that they get separated by storms or mm -hmm or a shark bitten mother or separated by sharks. Or in some cases, the mother is not healthy enough to be able to raise a pup and she might abandon it. Yeah, and in the very rare instance that a female sea otter gives birth to twins, usually she doesn't really have the resources to support raising a second pup. And so sometimes we're able to step in there and rescue that second pup after she abandons it here to the aquarium and then our moms can take over from there helping to raise those pups. So that's uh, one of the ma many reasons why we might have those rescued sea otters here at the aquarium. Yeah. Sorry, my voice is like going away right there. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I just, hey, uh, I was getting choked up talking about our otter moms. That's all. It, that, um, that's normal, Emily. And speaking of going away, I went away from the idea of trying to pull up the graphic because I'm like, well, we have otter photos. So I'm going to bring up a photo real quick here of um uh, of ivy and you can see just how grizzled she is where she's got a uh, blonde fur all the way down uh beyond her uh beyond her front paws um and you can see just how blonde she is on her head and on her chest and in the background you have rosa who's blonde mostly just on her head and then all the way in the background of that we have abby who's mostly brown all the way over with just a little bit of lightness so you can see there that grizzling yeah. there that's ivy there up on screen everyone when you, we were and, talking about grizzling that's what we mean yeah and in that photo ivy is actually the youngest of those yes. three otters so Rosa is our oldest at 20 years old, and you can see that she has that blonde fur on her head, but that's pretty much been her look her entire life uh, versus Ivy here, who was born fairly blonde, but has only gotten more and more blonde as she has gotten older. 
So she just happens to be a more more grizzled sea otter to begin with. Uh, but she's one of those moms that you see in here right now and one of the easiest ways that we can identify her. Um, we had a question here. Are there any social dynamics between the otters? Do they have any oh, that's a great question. family rankings or anything like that, Michelle, if you want to take um, that one? Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. We have, when you're in the wild, you have a, a group of otters called a raft. And usually in that raft, there's one territorial male. Not always, but um, a lot of times, especially in certain areas. And one territorial male will oversee several females, but the females don't necessarily stay in that one raft. They might move down coast or up coast to a different group and hang out there for a while. Um, over the years, we have seen a few mothers and pups being in the same raft together, but they're not interacting with each other. Um, but they do seem to possibly recognize each other at some point. Yeah, and I know at least for our sea otters here, um, there's definitely some interesting social dynamics that you can see. Yeah. Ivy and Kit um, happen to be really close in age. And for those of you who are familiar with our otter cams or have visited the aquarium before and have seen two sea otters wrestling and playing oh and goodness. just getting into all the mischief this, together. This that's view Ivy right now, Kit. this view right yeah. now, this is uh, this Ivy is parenting <laughs> right now. And you can see how the pup maybe just escaped from her and is now over on the other side. Yep, there she is. And Ivy is there not is. having it. This is a very, <laughs> uh, very good metaphor for, I'm sure, what a lot of you folks tuning in are going through, potentially with Wrangle. your with, yeah, wrangling children. And you can see uh, just how active sea otter mom surrogacy is uh, and why often after the pups are separated from their moms, why the moms might sleep for a few days in a row uh, after <laughs> um, being separate from from the yeah. from the pups there. But uh, I don't know if we've we've gone over this in detail. Michelle, can you describe to us how the surrogacy program started here uh, at the aquarium? Because it wasn't a given back in the day that we would have otter moms teaching otter pups how to be sea otters. It actually started off a little bit differently, right? Yeah, definitely. We started out a, quite a bit differently, actually, with um, one time someone told us when we were just raising these otters in tanks and then trying to release the pups back to the wild and not being very successful, someone suggested, well, why don't you just swim with them and take them out in the wild? And we tried that for a while and it was seemed to work, but it wasn't the best thing to do because the otters became sort of imprinted or used to seeing humans. So we had to come up with a different way of raising these guys. And it kind of happened a little bit serendipitously when we had an otter named Tula, who was in our care. She had come in one weekend, not doing very well. And uh, we also had an otter pup who came in and he was very unhappy being here and being in our tanks. And Tula, while she was here, gave birth to a pup, but it was not a live pup, it was a stillborn pup. So she was still sort of in that mothering mode of lactating and wanting to care for something. So sort of instantaneously, we said, why don't we put this pup with Tula and see what happens? And as soon as we did that, she took to the pup right away. And we began to follow and watch how everything uh, came up about into the future and we said maybe we can do this more next time it happens and uh tula was our first daughter to actually start the surrogacy program and we're really proud of her and from there we've gotten so many more otters um raised by surrogate moms including rosa and ivy and kit and selka yeah i mean ivy here is is quite the uh super mom when it comes to raising pups yes uh, this is her eighth pup that she is raising right now and Kit, this is her sixth pup that she is raising and um, yeah us, which is just awesome and uh, i just wanted to point out that ivy is uh, one of the most uh, feisty mothers out there that i'm aware of when it comes to the <laughs> when it comes to the staff when um you know every so often we need to separate mom and pup uh to be able to weigh the pup make sure that pup is doing okay or uh, for other uh, exam reasons and ooh, looks like there's a lot of activity here in the exhibit right now with the otters kind of running around um but uh but yeah ivy is is a ferocious otter mom she's uh she's very protective of of her pup and so the bond is very very strong there uh with these otters 
Michelle, we we had a question. Um, so as a sea otter tracker, you're out there watching mm -hmm. sea otters all day, and you're probably you you've probably got a clipboard out there, uh, taking notes on what otters are doing. Can you tell us a little bit what what would you be uh, rating right now in terms of how active these otters are? Is this pretty uh, regular? How would you be how would you be sort of scoring the the activity right now in terms of what you're seeing? <laughs> right now, their activity is highly active. Yeah. <laughs> um, these guys are a little bit different than the ones you would see in the wild because they don't really have to go hunting for food. Their food is basically brought to them, either thrown into the tank or we have special ports at the bottom of this exhibit that shoots food out. So they don't have to spend a lot of time actually trying to find their next meal, whereas in the wild, mothers and pups are going to be spending more time searching for prey. So a funny story that came to mind when I was watching Ivy was a female that I watched for many years who she was trying to forage, go down to the bottom and bring prey up for her and her pup. And the pup kept swimming off to go play with another pup. And she wasn't very happy about that. So she would swim over to the pup and just like Ivy is grabbing onto her pup, she would grab it and bring it back and then actually force it to go down underwater with her but then she, the pup would pop up before mom and start swimming away. And so she spent more time trying to bring the pup back to her and hopefully teaching it how to look for food than actually spending time herself getting food. Wow. Oh man. Talk about something to, to see from shore there. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was yeah. pretty fun. Um, but some of the things that we actually do collect in the in the field is looking at forage dives. So when these otters get released, um, the two pups that you see, once they get released, we'll be spending a lot of time watching them to make sure that they integrate back into the wild. So we'll be collecting foraging data on them. So how much time does it take for them to dive down and pick up a prey? Is, are they successful with a prey item? Are they not successful? And where do they travel to? Um, sometimes if they swim long distances, that's not good because they're burning a lot of energy. And if they stay more locally, that's a little better. So we record a lot of different things about them. Yeah. And, you know, it's really important that we're gathering that foraging data. And that's actually something that we really rely on these sea otter moms to help teach those pups. It's one of the things uh, that they're teaching the pups in their surrogacy right now is how to forage, how to dive, how to crack open those tough shells and get to all the good stuff inside. Um, we're seeing a great example of another one of those top behaviors with our sea otters right now with Ivy and 883 there in the otter spa uh, with all that grooming. Um, these sea otters are teaching those pups everything that they need to know how to be an otter. So some of the folks online were wondering what are some of those top behaviors and we're seeing great examples of that right now. But um, I know that grooming is another big part of um, otter observations with you out there in the field, making sure that they're taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. basically, Michelle. Yeah, they, they spend a bit of time of gro time grooming, but it's not one of the things that you see a lot. So foraging is probably the biggest thing. And if you were to, we do what's called activity budgets, and we go out and we follow an otter for six or 12 or 24 hours. And every 10 minutes record its behavior so that we can get an idea of what does it spend its day doing? Just like what we do during the day, we wanna know what an otter does during the day. So about 40 to 50% of the time, depending on whether it's a mom and a pup or a female by herself or a male, they may spend that much time um, just looking for food and eating food and opening it up and spending time foraging. Um, the rest of the, a lot of the rest of the time is resting and then a smaller percentage is grooming. And then of course you can break it up into interacting with other otters or, or their pups as well. That's awesome. Uh, Michelle, we also have a very important question. Yes, for I you think, right now. I think it's the same question that I've been looking at, Emily, take it away. It's been, it's been going through the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is the one that I've seen going through quite a few of the chats right now, because people of course are tuning into these webcams right now, watching the otters and just absolutely loving it. Michelle, how can they get your job? How can they be an otter <laughs> yeah. watcher too? Um, and we're here to defend you, just so you know, in case people are showing yeah. up, you know, just, just well, let us know. Maybe should I quit or something? No, I'm um, no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, no, I started out as a volunteer. So I was going to college and I got a bachelor's degree in college. And while I was 
taking classes. I was very interested in animal behavior. That was my main focus, and also ecology and evolutionary biology. And I started volunteering. I was lucky enough to start to volunteer when the aquarium opened. And uh, some, one of the, not the first volunteer for sure, but one of the first sea otter volunteers for wild otter research. And um, got my degree in environmental sciences. And then I went and got another degree and um, just was always being out in the field and observing otters and have been really fortunate and lucky to be able to do it through the Monterey Bay Aquarium. That's awesome. And, and we are very lucky to have you, We Michelle. are, absolutely. Michelle. And we do, yep. well, we do take interns and volunteers in our program. And if you were on the, look on the website, um, we're happy to, you know, you can fill out applications and talk to our volunteer coordinator and our intern coordinators. And um, that happens all the time. You have to be 18 in order to do it, but we do have opportunities like that. Yeah. Michelle, um, switching gears just a little bit, I've got a little bit of a rapid fire Q and A here, just to to answer some quick questions. Are are you ready for a few questions? Here sure, go for it. All right. Question number one. I've been seeing it go by. Mario Ace has been asking over and over and over. How fast is a sea otter? How fast? How fast oh, the, can they swim? Yeah. Um. I'll give one example. The only one that I'm familiar with is two miles an hour. Um. We did okay. a release. We did a release of a sea otter at. Uh, in Monterey Bay on one end of the bay, and he swam 22 miles. Um, I think whatever that worked out to be, I forgot. It was at 10 mi 10 hours, I think, we were able to follow him in an airplane. Wow. So, But he was determined to get from point A to point B, so that's probably unusual. Okay, so there you go. You, bought, you got about two miles an hour, which in water is very impressive, especially considering sea otters are not your most streamlined uh, marine mammal compared to, say, like a a seal or, or a dolphin. Okay. Uh, awesome. Next follow-up question. This is a, this is a question we get a lot. Is it true, Michelle, that otters in the wild hold hands so that they do not drift apart? That is a question everyone asks, is this, I know. is this real? Does it happen? Or is it just that one video we've all seen on the well, internet? I've talked to a lot of colleagues and for many, many years, we felt like this was just something that happened in a captive setting. Um, these animals that they did the video of, but one of my colleagues recently, and she was the person who was most not happy about <laughs> otters holding hands to for drifting away, and she was the actual person who saw it in the wild for the first time herself, and she had to say that she had been wrong. So, I don't know if it's holding hands to keep from drifting away necessarily, but they they do hold not hands, but you know they are paws and touching paws together so they do hold paws and it's not just it's not just adults and their pups it might be other adults as well could be two juvenile females or sub adults yeah okay so now okay so we have that cleared up that's awesome <laughs> and then the last uh the last question that i was just seeing going by that's very that's very common people want to know what's up with the fur of a sea otter why are they spending so much time grooming why is the sea otter fur so important Ah, the sea otter fur is really important because they don't have a lot of blubber. Like some of your seals and sea lions that you see along the beach, they have a lot of blubber to keep them warm. And the only thing keeping a sea otter warm is their very, very dense fur. So they want to keep it absolutely clean all the time. And that's why you're constantly or you're seeing them scratching and grooming and rubbing and blowing into it a little bit um, to keep air in the fur. And this is so that the water doesn't get through the fur and into the skin so they would get cold. That's awesome. Gotcha. Uh, Michelle, another quick question that I've seen a couple of times coming by here. Um, how long do sea otter pups stay with their mothers? Uh-oh. Oh, it's coming back. Don't worry, Michelle. Yeah, we had a little bit of buffering there on the stream, so the stream will be right back. Okay. Yeah. I just heard Emily, how long do, and that's all I heard. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, here, I can try that again, uh, Michelle. Uh, how long do sea otter pups stay with their mothers is a question that we, we've seen uh, going by here. Ah, that's a really good question. Um, sea otter pups usually stay with their moms anywhere from four months of age to average, they say, is about six months of age. But I've also witnessed a pup stay with its mother for, until it was 10 months old. So, But normally they're weaned by 
four or five months, I'm sorry, five or six months of age. That's awesome. And and Patrick, I'm yes. I'm getting distracted by the cuteness it's, on screen. It's, of, it's pretty uh, adorable. Yeah. That's that appears <laughs> to be you. eight that appears to be eight sixty wrapped up yeah. in uh, in the fake kelp. Now we have fake kelp, everyone, in the sea otter exhibit because sea otters are very curious, which translates to very uh, destructive. Uh, if we had real kelp in there, it would just get ripped up. Um, as you can see right now, 860 uh, chewing on that kelp just to land, trying to wrap herself up in the kelp. That is uh, absolutely That's really adorable. adorable. Um, we also had yes. a couple of questions going by about the sea otter spa, which I know that yeah, you and I can answer real quick, Patrick. Go for it. Um, the water in there, isn't any warmer than the rest of the exhibit that they are in right now. Uh, it just happens to be one of their favorite spots, that little <laughs> cutout in the rock work. There are underwater tunnels that lead to that little otter spa there. Um, and on a normal day when they aren't raising sea otter pups and they're hanging out here inside the exhibit, you will often find Ivy and Kit taking Ooh. a nap together in there. And so uh, if you ever see an otter in that otter spa, when Ivy and Kit are on exhibit, it's usually one of them that's in there or both of them in there in kind of a an otter cuddle puddle. Uh, but that's just a safe spot for them where they don't drift away with the water flowing inside of the exhibit. Same temperature of the water. They just like how cozy it is. <laughs> and we, it looks like... Um... We, I mean, we've got such a good look there. You saw the flipper tags there on the back, everybody. And a, a quick little fun fact there about the flipper tags is if you look at your hand, you've got your five digits there. Well, same thing with the sea otters. They've got five digits. And depending if you count from your thumb as one, two, three, four, five across your fingers, five being your pinky finger, uh, you can see that the flipper tags there for 860 are located um, on one of them between one and two and the other one between four and five, it looks like to me. And that is another way for uh, Michelle and her team to be able to tell the difference between sea otters, not only the color combination, but also the location on the flipper. You're able to tell uh, where those flipper tags are. Michelle, did I get that right? Is uh, where You did, Okay, yeah. yes. Perfect. Um, <laughs> and one of, one of the, the interesting things about it is like the um, usually on the right foot, like at 860, you'll see the tag in between the first and second digit, which are the ones closer to the tail. And that is an indicator that the otter, that flipper tag, if you didn't know anything about it, you would know that it's a female sea otter. Oh, whoa. I didn't know that. Yeah, is uh, new information for me too. Thank you, Michelle. We're learning things you today. So you can see those flipper tags there because um, the way that uh, you were describing it, Michelle. So you're tracking these sea otters. They have uh, they have transmitters, so you can follow them. But then, if you had your otter with five other otters without any external view, mm -hmm. uh, it would be almost impossible to to tell which otter it is you're actually you're actually looking at. So that's where those uh, color combinations and flipper tags come from. So if any of you folks out there are along the coast of Monterey, along the coast of California, and you see those flipper tags, you know that it is an otter that is being tracked by our researchers there. Um, yes. And cool. Patrick, I, I do want to point out a behavior that we are seeing right now yes. with 860. Um, that as she's kind of rolling around in the water, you'll notice that she's keeping her paws as far as away from the yes. water as she <laughs> yes. can. She's got those paws up out of the water. Can you explain what's happening there, Michelle? Yeah, a lot of times when they're getting ready to rest um, and they finished grooming, they want to stay, keep their paws and their feet warm and dry. And that's also where they lose the most heat from their body is where they're from their paws and their feet or flippers, rear flippers. So if they keep them out of the water, they're going to stay drier that way. As you can see, she's twirling around and those rear flippers are not going underwater. They're staying up. Can't see the front. When, yeah. And the paws are staying really close to the mouth as well. So she's just trying to keep them dry because she knows she'll stay warmer then. Because the water inside the exhibit is actually coming straight from the Monterey Bay. And usually on average, that seawater that these sea otters are living in, usually somewhere around... 50 to 60 degrees. So this is cold water that they are living in and without that layer of blubber to help keep them warm and really relying on that really densely packed fur coat. Uh, these sea otters want to make sure that those areas that don't have any fur on them, uh, like the pads of their paws and their nose and areas that have uh, thinner fur on them that aren't quite as insulated like their back flippers are kind of staying up out of the water as much as they can. 
and their body temperature is very a little warmer than ours. They're about 98 to 100 degrees is what their normal body temperature should be. Gotcha. So that's yes. how they want to keep it there. Um, yeah. There's uh, another another um, very common fact that everybody knows about sea otters, Michelle. I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring it up to you to see what your thoughts are. Can you tell us about sea otter armpit pockets? We've had a few people asking us <laughs> about the pockets and a follow up. Do they actually have a favorite rock that they always carry around with them? Some popular sea otter fun facts that people tend to throw out. What's what's the truth there? OK, so for the sea otter pocket, um, what it is is just an extra flap of skin. So if you were to wear a loose or baggy shirt or sweater and you pulled your arm out, you notice how the there's a lot of extra material in there. And you could actually stick a clam or a rock or something in that uh, little extra material part and then close your arm up like she has done in this photo or in the video here. And you would have a, something hidden under there. And so we've always called it a pocket. And it's a right it's on the same side. You, I'm sorry, on both sides, you can have one on the right or on the left. And oftentimes when otters are diving down to get food, they will um, go get, say, a bunch of turban snails or snails as they're swimming back up and they've taken them off the kelp fronds. And they'll actually have them under their arm or in their pocket. And then they'll start to open that prey with a rock that they might be holding as well. And uh, one at a time, they'll pull the snails out. And actually, we can count how many snails they've eaten because we'll see them pull them out and crack it on the rock. Wow. Now, as far as a favorite tool goes, some otters uh, certainly do carry around favorite tools with them all the time. Not all the time, just during a certain certain foraging bout or time that they're feeding. And they may keep it through the first one or the one or two otters of that, sorry, one or two hours of that foraging bout. But then the next day they might get another rock. But the interesting part about it is, is that rocks seem to be the same shape and size each time they use one. So they may have a preference for a certain size rock or a certain style rock. Oh, interesting. Um, That's really interesting, yeah. Um, I, I wanna give uh, everybody in the chat here, just very quickly, if you could give uh, a quick round of a pause to Curtis here uh, for keeping us on uh, the cam. Curtis is currently the one flying us around. He uh, is our webcam master, uh, and he's the one who um, put in this amazing webcam here where he, we were actually able to zoom in and we could see the little uh, nails on the paw there uh, for a little bit. That is one of my favorite aspects there of the of sea otters. They're incredibly, incredibly dexterous, and they do have those little those little fingernails there off the off the back of the um, of the paw there. Uh, Michelle, can you describe to us just how dexterous sea otters are, their, their feats of, of foraging? Because it's really pretty impressive what they're able to pull off. Well, a lot of times, yeah, that's true. Um, they will be able to retrieve prey items that are really far into the rocks. So like an abalone or a crab that's Sort of nestled all the way down into the rock, they will actually use their paw to reach in there and and try to pull it out. They're also very good at taking the exhibit apart. And they if are. you leave anything loose in the exhibit, they'll um, unscrew nuts and bolts if they can, using both of their paws. So they they definitely can do some damage sometimes if you're not careful and you don't otterproof a place that they're in. Yeah, and otter proofing is something that is uh, discovered via trial and error. I can I can imagine. You can see right now. Oh man, Curtis is going all the way in. You can see right now how she. <laughs> you can see how she's holding on to that little blade of fake kelp there, and just how it's nestled there. She really like they're they're so dexterous. They 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 if you know if you're a fidgeter, if you're someone who needs something in your hands to uh, to move around, you you've got some sea otter DNA. Um, the otters, they just love to hold on to something. You can see her doing that uh, right now. Oh, that is... This This is quite a moment of pause. Pat. This is quite a moment of pause. <laughs> Great job, Curtis, on the on the 
camera yeah. on the camera work yeah this is excellent michelle right michelle this is actually a really good time we we've got such a good zoom in here on the fur of the sea otter can you tell us some of the adaptations that that fur has to help keep them warm because one of the things that you folks might notice is that it looks like they've got the these peaks these triangles of fur there um like a, sort of like a yeah, yeah, can can you describe that? Little, the little, they have two layers of fur. They have yeah. the guard hairs, and then they have the under fur. And the guard hairs will actually come together, like you can see on her head there, that they're like almost little points, and that helps keep uh, the air underneath to keep them warm. Yeah, this is really awesome stuff. Oh, and we can see the ear of a sea otter. Uh, Michelle, can yep, you can you right can you describe a little bit about the the sensory perception of, of sea otters because. Uh, when people are watching this cam, they might see a lot of uh, mustache flicks and, uh, and you know, besides how, how dexterous they are, they've got quite a few other ways of sensing around uh, their, their environment, right? Not sure if hearing is too but, important for sea otters, but how um, do they find their way around? A, they have a really good sense of smell. And um, you, if you ever looked inside an otter nose, which you can't, right now i don't think very well but they have a lot of what they call turbinates in there and they can really smell things very well one of the things that we always have to be careful for when we're in the wild doing sea otter research projects and we want to capture an otter we have to make sure that we're actually downwind of them because oh, otherwise they can sense us they, we call it winding and they'll be able to sense that we're there so they might be laying around in the kelp and if you were to quietly go by to uh, too close and all of a sudden you see them perk up um, they have actually smelled you and know that you're coming wow so, wow so the ears on the otters are very tiny as you can see and a lot of times when they dive within our exhibit the ears will actually flatten out on the sides of their head to close down a little to um, give them to keep the water out I'm pretty sure and they do have a good sense of hearing a pretty good sense of hearing but not super great but they do have those high-pitched squeals so a mom who's in the water and she's separated from her pup she will be able to hear it because probably many of you have heard that really high-pitched otter sound when a pup is calling to its mom and so the mom's able to hone in on exactly where her pup is and start swimming towards it to bring it back and then that's that sound is like the most heartbreakingly cute little it <laughs> is yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll stop. Yeah, we'll stop with the impressions on on the live stream. At least on my. Well, at least on my. You're doing just fine, Patrick. Those are great. Um, <laughs> you guys can chat back and forth. Exactly. Um, yeah. Another question, Michelle. Um, so I don't know if we brought this up quite yet, but there are some people who are asking: uh, Is it okay to get close to sea otters? Can we touch them? Can you pet them? What's going on with sea otters? That is a very important question because obviously they are one of the most cute animals in existence but sea otters are not an animal that you want to approach under any circumstances can you explain that to to the folks yeah thanks patrick this is a good topic to talk about um sea otters are a wild animal as much as they look super cute and you think you could come up to them and pet them um it's best to keep your distance from them we've also worked very hard at trying not to disturb them so if you're happen to be kayaking with family or friends, you want to keep your distance away from an otter because and um, travel if you're paddling through, paddle your kayak sort of parallel to them, rather not aimed directly at them because they're resting, they're trying to um, conserve their energy and they don't want to be disturbed. It's kind of like if you were sleeping in your house and somebody kept walking past you every five or 10 minutes, you would wake up and never get a really good night's sleep. So the sea otter moms re really need to, when they are resting, they really need to rest because they have to conserve their energy to start feeding, especially when they have a pup. They need to dive down and get more food. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for joining this afternoon. You're uh, welcome. We want to make sure that we're being respectful of everybody's time, but yep. if all of you in the comments can just sound off with a huge, huge thank you for Michelle for joining us today and helping us talk otters. I know it's a 
It's a tough job talking about these uh, otters today. But, but it's a fun job, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, folks all You're around welcome. the world. Uh, thanks, Emily. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, everybody, an otterly possum day. Uh, thanks, everyone, signing off for now. All right. Bye-bye.